a subsidiary of First Quantum Minerals Limited. President Hakainde Hichilema took over from former President Edgar Lungu and the PF administration during a challenging time when the world was dealing with a global pandemic and the economy was struggling, along with a growing debt crisis. Now, these issues have led to high levels of poverty and inequality in the country. During the campaign, the UPND administration promised to steer the country back to economic prosperity, ensuring that all citizens are included in the development process. They also pledged to invest in people by providing resources Resources for healthcare, education, the agriculture, and mining sectors. It's now three years this August since the UPND took office. Big questions to be answered. Have they delivered on their campaign promises? Tonight, we examine the UPND's three years in office through the lens of the Socialist Party's perspective. I'll be talking to my guest right after this. Costa with me, Costa Mwansa. Tonight we discuss three years of the United Party for National Development in office, and my guest is the leader of the Socialist Party in Zambia, in Dr. Fred Membe. Dr. Membe, it's always a pleasure to host you in Costa. Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much. I think you have recently been on a number of tour of duties. I think uh, the most recent is five days at uh, the Twin Palm uh, police station. Uh, before that, um, you were part of a, 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 an entourage uh, or a delegation from your party uh, monitoring elections in South America, particular Venezuela. Um, let's, let's begin from there. Um, the outcome of this election has been protested. Reports indicate that around 2,400 arrests and clashes linked to the protests have resulted in at least 23 deaths. The United States administration through Foreign Secretary, you know, uh, Tom Blinken saying that these elections were not free and fair and really labeling uh, your comrade Nicolas Maduro a dictator and a tyrant running Venezuela with an iron fist against the will of the Venezuelan people. What is your reaction? Action as a team that was on the ground to monitor these elections? Yes, we monitored the elections. Three of us from the Socialist Party went there. Dr. Musmari, myself, Comrade Akende, we monitored those elections. And it's not the first time I've monitored elections in Venezuela. The first time I monitored elections in Venezuela was in 2012. These were the last elections Commandant Hugo Chavez participated in. I was in the company that time of General Obasanjo, or President Obasanjo of Nigeria. We were moving together, we visited the, all the other parts. We also had the Qatar Center monitoring those elections. Those elections were won by Chavez, who died a year later in 2013, they were denounced by the Americans. They were denounced by the opposition that participated. I've never seen an electoral system that is so tight proof than the Venezuelan one. It has got, integ it, it, is integra it has got five audits integrated in it. You simply can't cheat your way. Even the Qatar Center passed the, the, the electoral system as the best in the world in 2012. The Qatar Center passed, passed it as the best. 
At one time, the Qatar Center had demanded for some 1% audit because it's so electronic. They gave them 54% audit instead of just 1%. They have held 31 elections in the last 25 years of the Chavistas government. 31 election, 25 elections, 31 elections in 25 years. They have lost two of them. One was under Chavez, they lost the referendum. Chavez accepted the defeat. The other one was after, a year after Maduro was elected. President Maduro accepted the congressional defeat. What did the Americans and their agents in Venezuela do? They took the congressional defeat of the Chavistas, turned it into an, a presidential defeat. They wanted to use that to throw out the president. It's like here, you win parliament, you, lose, you, you, you win the president, you lose a majority in parliament. And then the speaker who is elected by the, major, the minority declares himself president. So That's what you, happened. Are, are you saying then that these protests of over 2,400 arrests and what the American government and its observers alike are saying then is baseless? Yes, it is baseless. They have been violent throughout. President Chavez won the elections in 1998 for the first time. He won the elections. In 2002, he was overthrown by the Americans and their agents in Venezuela. An elected president, overthrown. The people of Venezuela had to rise up on the streets and brought him back. They brought him back. They brought Chavez back from the island where they had taken him. One would argue then, you know, uh, Dr. Member, that your socialist belief and alignment similar to what comrade maduro and the most of the venezuelan system believes in probably gives you a conflict of interest then to not see things in an objective perspective we are not the only ones who monitor the elections i told you general basan was there yes we're talking about 2024 no even now mm. we were not the socialists mm. i was with a catholic bishop there from the usa have they declared the elections yes. free and fair? Yes. So the American we had a Catholic bishop from the USA. Why would the Americans then, through Foreign Secretary they Blinken, say that these results should be rejected and the will of the Venezuelan people should be adhered to? The Americans themselves have the problems with their own elections. Mm. So they have no moral right or standing? No, I'm just saying they have problems with their own elections. Mr. Trump is still rejecting the elections of three years ago or so. He's calling, he's calling it a fraud. They accept elections that they want to accept. The Venezuelan elections, they have never accepted an election in Venezuela over the last 25 years. They have never accepted. No matter who you take there, they, ac they reject the elections even before they take place. The violence that you are talking about is of sponsored people. The deaths that occurred were not from the, 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 the Maduro government side. They were mainly from the opposition who were set on the street to attack people. I was there. I saw it for myself. Before we come to discuss the, the, the local and domestic issues, Dr. Membe, um, just you know, in conclusion on, on these international matters, looking at the current geopolitical setup, with the example you've given, the insurrection of January 6th um, in uh, 2020, uh, and, 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 and obviously um, issues happening with the American election and, and what happens in the UN, the Russia-Ukraine war, the Israel-Gaza war, the relations between Pyongyang and, 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 and the US. Basically, when we look at geopolitics, are we still in a global order where America still needs or feels that they should consider themselves a superpower above all and that only what they say should be the global order and should go? Yes, that's what they think, but that is being challenged. It's being challenged, and that's what is causing the tensions. Not everybody is saying that order should prevail forever. 
We have lived under a bipolar world. Probably you were much younger when the world was dominated by the Soviet Union and the USA. We thought it was bad. After 1990 or 1991, we got into a monopolar world or unipolar world dominated by the USA. Today, the world, after almost over 30 years of living with that, is saying, no, we can't have this. We need a multipolar world. Multipolarity is being demanded today. We can't all have the way of the USA as our way. Each country, each people has the right to determine its own destiny. They have the right to choose their own path of development. Our histories are different, our circumstances are different. We want to be Zambians. We want to do our own thing. We value, we should value our sovereignty, we should value our independence. Friend or foe should not dictate to us what to do. The same way I can be your best friend today, I can't dictate how you should run your home. That's out of bounds. No matter how strong the bonds are, you have to run your home, I have to run my home. That doesn't mean we are enemies. The USA wants to dictate to the whole world what to do. How many governments have they toppled? They are the killers of the great Muammar Gaddafi. They have left Libya today in turmoil. They are the killers of Saddam Hussein. How many people have they killed in Syria? How many people have they killed in Afghanistan? How many people have they killed in Somalia? Wherever they don't want a regime, they will tell lies first. They told us of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Later on, we came to know the truth. It was a lie. Why did they kill Muhammad Gaddafi? Why did they kill Patrice Rumumba? Now we know they killed Patrice Rumumba for simply saying the wealth of Congo belongs to the Congolese people and Africa. And they should benefit the Congolese people and Africa. Nkrumah was also killed for the same reason for trying to take a pan-African path. He was toppled and later died. Mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with, with those statements made, um what a good way for us then to begin to start coming back home uh, in that fast forward from the examples you give of Mubutu Seseko and Patrice Lumumba and the Pan-African leaders of, you know, the 60s and the 70s, um, Africa again is in a very rare you know, position. Uh, I, I love to describe this as a second scramble for Africa, really, because mm -hmm. as the world wants to respond to climate change and going to a greener future, Zambia, the Congo, among the only few privileged countries in the world to be sitting on lithium, to be sitting on cobalt and nickel that the world largely needs. Yeah, critical and, needs. And, and there's this huge interest from obviously the so-called West and the superpowers and all this uh, huge investment that we're clapping over in Mingomba and, and, and everything. How then should we be positioning ourselves to the benefit of having our own sovereignty but benefiting in a very strategic way over these resources that God has granted us? Without defending our sovereignty, without defending our independence, and having the right to take our own path, we are not going to get benefit again from these critical minerals. The same way we failed to benefit from more than 100 years of mining copper and cobalt. We are not going to benefit. Look, they have been mining for over 100 years. <coughs> and we have been working on those mines. Our people have died in those mines. Their lifespans have been reduced on those, dead, uh, on those mines. What is the benefit to us? If we were sharing even 50-50, or even us getting 30% of what was produced, we wouldn't be in this poverty we are in today. They got everything. They got the minerals, and they got the money from the minerals. We were left with nothing. They can say we are irresponsible, we have not managed our affairs well. Even if we had not managed our affairs well as a people, 
we would have reached people who would have benefited from that if they were leaving something here. We don't want anybody, again, whether friend or foe, east, west, south, north, to come and get our resources and leave us with nothing. Yes, they can come and exploit together with us our resources, but let's share the benefits from those resources, mineral resources, fairly. We want our fair share. We don't want it to go to the same system that exploited us to this level from 1891 to where we are today. God gave us what we needed to survive and prosper. But here is the Is Africa, is Zambia, is the Congo uh, in danger of the second scramble? And um, with, 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 with all these resources and the things that I've described, um, are we just illusioning or are we crafting or, 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 or orchestrating theories around even fears that you yourself have allayed over? the U.S.'s strong establishment of things like military bases. Is there any connection to all this? Costa, I had a very interesting conversation with a colleague I met in Venezuela <coughs> from Uganda. He told me something that scared me. He's a senior person in the ruling party there. I asked him, what is the situation, what is your view on what is happening in Eastern Congo? He told me, we don't want a stable Eastern Congo. It's not in our benefit to have a stable Eastern Congo. That's what he told me. I said, why? It's, it's not good for our economy, it's not good for our political order. Insofar as Uganda is concerned? Yes, this was Uganda. I said, what about uh, Rwanda? He says, Rwanda, we want it the way it is. It's for our benefit to have the Rwanda the way it is. So clearly, they don't want a stable Congo. Nobody wants a stable Congo, those who have benefited from it. Those who have benefited from an unstable Congo, they don't want a DRC that is stable. And that has been the order of Congo since Walpole the second set foot and colonized that territory, turned it in, into its own personal property. Congo has never had peace because of the wealth that is in that country. It's one of the richest countries in the world mm. in terms of resources. It's, 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 but it's, one of the poorest it's today. Sad, it's sad, very wealthy, rich, but poor, yes, you say, and for the last four decades, no peace in, in, in the Eastern Congo. And we share a huge you know, border with, with the Congo, you know, Dr. Membe. And it moves me to my next question. You were recently you know, arrested and detained by police uh, for allegedly engaging in what they have charged you with as seditious practices. I, I, I saw your brief comments to journalists, you know, Dr. Member, rather very strong. You describe your arrest as nonsensical. Quoting you, you said stupid. But don't your allegations, being a lawyer yourself, as a journalist, when there are no facts, Dr. Membe, is it right for you to just allege such statements that may brew conflict between Zambia and its neighbors? I've been a journalist for not less than 27 years. Mm -hmm. And if my memory serves me right, we never lost any case of libel. If we did, it's very little compared to the volumes of work we did. Yes, I'm a lawyer. I know what a defamation is. I know what sedition is. To call what I said seditious, I repeat again, is foolishness, high grade. It's stupidity, high grade. It's desperation, high grade. Let's go to the definition of sedition. What is sedition? Does that amount to sedition? If there's anybody who felt defamed by what I said, they have the right to take civil procedure. You're alleging that the president of the DRC, President Felix Tisekedi, has 
paid or, or, or bribed our government, or is it through you know, President Hichinama, in the sum of 20 million US dollars to buy silence? Did I mention Hichinama? Again, let's not import things that were not said. What I said in that piece is, Chisekedi himself told Catholic bishops who had gone to see him. What I said. The bishops are there. The bishops are there. Did Chisekedi say what he said? Yes. Uh, Catholic bishops liars? I've never known them to be liars. And it's not one bishop. And we are, we are not, I'm not the only one who produced that story. What, it was what, also published by other people. Why would the president of the DRC be buying silence from Zambia? That's for him to answer. I'm not just a kid. I'm not just a kid. You've been charged. Is this, uh, are you... Are you Willing to uh, is is this matter proceeding to court for you to defend yourself? No, I'll be happy to for it to go to, to court. Let's go and dig But I want to find out from you further uh, in, in in what you were writing. What were your concerns again for the sake of the public and in interest of the, in, in public interest? Wh why should Zambia be paid twenty million dollars to buy their silence I, for what? I, I think it costs it to be unfair for me mm. for a matter that but in national being, interest and in for a matter interest, that mm. I'm being prosecuted on. To Are we being prejudiced? It's not going to court. No, it's not going to court mm. but you wanted to argue my case I put up my defense I'm asking in public interest no what public interest well about about my interest <laughs> I'm facing criminal proceedings mm. so I should put up my defense no, no. on television B based on no it's not in my interest mm. to discuss that issue to that level you would rather discuss it in court yes because I'm going to face court mm. so why don't you allow me the opportunity to use my evidence in court granted I think it's fair. Well, mm. if, if you feel those are your rights, well, I was asking in mm. public interest, fair enough. Fair enough. Let's, let's, let's move on before we, we, we discuss your analysis of three years in office of, of the UPND. Um, while you were out in Venezuela, you know, uh, observing and monitoring the elections in that country, um, the boat in your own party seems to be rocking. You know, Dr. Membe, uh, observers uh, describing you and your party leadership with certain aspects of tyranny or, or dictatorship. Um, you do not accept divergent views, and the Socialist Party is not democratic. It all started with one, you know, Father Frank Walia uh, joining your party later on, coming out and defecting to the UPND, saying you do not tolerate views of others. Then we've seen in the more recent past the termination of Antonio Mwanza's position, mm -hmm. whatever he's been accused of. Then we saw uh, Tri Momwenda, Chris Chinda. Today we've seen Vanessa Shamilimo, your chairperson in Livingston. What is really happening in the Socialist Party? Things seem to be falling apart. Uh, let's put it this way. Let me start with the Mr. Frankie Wadi. Mm. Mr. Frankie Wadi or Father Frankie Wadi has been in and out of my life and my wife's life a number of times. <coughs> and back. Whenever he comes back, we receive him. When he finds new friends, he goes. He forgets us. When he comes back again, we will receive him. You have never heard me go and talk to you of Father of Gwalia. And I will not talk to you of him. Let's go back to Zambian politics. Facts should also be anchored on factors. How many, you mentioned a few people, how many people does the party have? How many members? How many members in the structures where those few people have left, have been fired or resigned? How many are still there? You'll find that the number is very small. It's very, very small. We receive new members almost every day. There is no political party that has received more members in the recent past month 
than the SP. We have more mem we have had we have more members who have left PF than any other political party. Not even UPND has taken more members from PF than us. We have more how, members. How, how do you let show, me just finish my how, point. how do you show the taking of these members? Yes, uh, let me just finish. Mm -hmm. We have more members who have come from UPND to join us than any other political party has had from UPND. If you look at our structures in some of the provinces, the entire leadership in one of the provinces, all the key leaders came from UPND and then from PF. We don't publicize who join us. You have never seen us, or you have rarely seen us if it happened, parading so, defect, so many defectors here and there. So if I'm getting you right, you're saying these, uh, these resignations from your party are minor compared very, to... Very small. But wouldn't you call this in the eyes of others as a crisis because these are not just ordinary members they are holding positions people you appoint Trimon Wanda the election chairperson um, Chris Jinda a member of the National Management Committee you're talking of Antonio Mwanza you yourselves appointed him to a bigger role okay. your chair lady in Livingston so so certainly let even me, if you call the numbers minor these are people holding very senior let me come and back, crucial positions let me come in your back party. to that hmm. let's go back to 1991 after 1991 we had the MMD. I was involved in the MMD project. I sat on the interim executive committee of the MMD. Before the 1991 elections, we had other parties emerging from MMD. Did the MMD crumble? Was that a crisis? No, MMD went and won the elections. After the elections in 1991, 1993, we had a number of senior leaders of MMD resigning to form National Party. We had Humphrey Mlemba, Arthur Wina, Emmanuel Kasonde, Baldwin Nkumbula, Katongo Maine, among many others, Akashamba Tombiksi Talewanika, they formed UPND, uh, National Party. MMD did it crumble, it didn't. We had in 1996 or 1995, Zadeko being formed from MMD by the late Dean Mungomba, Dr. Mbita Chitala, among others. Did the MMD crumble? No. In, uh, let me just finish. Mm -hmm. In 1998, we had another group living with Mr. Mazoka to form UPND from MMD. Did the MMD crumble? No. In 2001, we had General Tembo. Edith Nawakwi, Simon Zukas, Dipaki Pateo, among many others, General Mianda, leaving MMD to form FDD, Heritage Party, and uh, probably another party. Did, uh, did MMD crumble? No. If I, if I may be allowed to put uh, a rider there, mm -hmm. I'm happy that you've gone all that far to give that example. Uh, and I'll ask you this. Uh, you, you've given a period where the MMD as a movement was so strong and democratic in its fundamentals that people could, could splinter and form political parties and compete. The more reason why Chiluba failed with the third term because nobody wanted an individual to hijack the party. I give this because what we see fast forward now in present day politics in Zambia is that political parties are single-handedly financed by the founders of these parties and they become the alpha and the omegas. So again, I would also argue that the Socialist Party is not the MMD of 1991. And, and, and I'll put you, this question directly to you. You're being accused of being the Alpha and the Omega of the Socialist Party, that only what you say should go, and those who have a different view to you, you kick them out. So are you a dictator, Dr. Membe? Let me go back again. I'm not the first person to be called that. Wasn't this an argument against Mr. Sata? Not yes, and I'm happy ago. you give that example. Wasn't this a, an argument against Mr. Ichilema because when he was in opposition? Because this is what we see, and exactly my example, Dr. Membe, that fast forward after what you gave in the MMD, we've seen parties attached to the founders and the financiers. 
So when you say Mr. Sata, yes, you say Mr. Hitchnema, these people have held their political parties as long as they're there, they'll be at the helm. UPND, how many vice presidents did it lose in opposition? We had uh, Mr. Patrick Chisanga, Mr. Bob Sichinga, Mr. Sakwiva Skota, Dr. Kenisha Sibanda, Mr. Richard Kapita. We had uh, my brother GBM as well. Among other senior leaders who left UPND, did UPND crumble? What, what are you trying to show, that it's democratic? No, 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 I'm just trying to say we need to look at factors as well. Mm -hmm. Examine facts in the light of factors as well. So what is so, so we had Mr. Sata. Mm, so so what is existing in the socialist party? You're not answering my question. No, I'm coming to that. Are I'm, you I'm, a I'm, dictator? You have been accused of being a dictator. That is why you welcome friends, and if they disagree with you, you throw them out. Yes, I, I've never thrown anybody out of the party. Mm. Is there a crisis in the socialist? No, party? there's no crisis. So why are these senior members leaving? They are not even. We are firing some. There is some issue of discipline. Okay. There has to be. There has to be discipline. Costa, you have run this station. People have come here, and have left. Are you a dictator? Maybe, you have lost people here. Maybe the company and, polit and the political party as a club, the rules will, will, will be different. We have churches. Yeah. It's not only political parties. We have churches in this country. People have left the Catholic Church as priests, as bishops. Is there a dictatorship that has made them leave? We are talking ab about my brother, Father Walia here. He left the Catholic Church. We have people in the politics today who are seminarians, they left. Every year we have priests who are leaving you, not only the Catholic Church, but other churches. We have splinter groups within churches, they go and form. Is there something, is there a crisis in the churches? Mm. How, so, how, how, how true are you to what you're saying, Dr. Membe? Now let me come to the issue where you're asking me if mm. I'm a dictator, because mm -hmm. you may appear like I'm, I'm evading the question. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Firstly, what is a dictator? A dictator rules by decrees. A dictator rules by decrees like the Pope. The Pope gives decrees. You can't question. I don't make any single decision alone in the party. The principles of the Socialist Party is collective leadership. Collective leadership at various levels. Any of these people who have left can they ever come and say, they came to me and said, let's do this and that, and said, get out of here? You know? I don't even interact with them. So why are they leaving then if you're saying this has never happened? People, Part of the reasons people, they say people, that. Uh, people leave. You, you, when you, they you're leave. Not, so, yeah, but, but when they the, leave, people always. This, this, this should worry you, or, or you, you, as a party, you need to take an introspection because the job of a political party two years before an election, just like Dr. Member, is, is to grow is to grow mm -hmm. the membership. Four or five senior members is politically far too much when you look at when you look at the optics of whether a party is strong or not. You disagree with that? No. It's not an issue. You if you, look, you don't think yeah, so? I dis I disagree with you. Mm. If you look at people leaving all these other political parties, the picture is not different. We are receiving members from PF, from UPND. Is there a crisis and, surely, and, and surely when you receive those members, you, you, you are made to believe that either your party is attractive or something is wrong where they are coming from. I can't say that because the people have gone 360. That's politics. People have gone 300. When you receive them on the platform. 360 degrees. When you receive them on the platform, what will you say? And there are other people who have who left, who are coming back again. For example, any big wigs that left your party that have come back? I don't want to name people here because mm. I would have named that. People mm. are quiet, coming in quietly. Why should I publicize them? There are people who have come into the party and have left. They themselves, they can speak for themselves. We also know people who have moved 360 degrees in this short time. They started with the UPND in opposition. They moved to PF, became DCs. PF loses elections, they have moved to SP. Some of them have gone back to UPND. 
any government. Why do you why do you tolerate them? Why do you welcome them? If you know, like you said, oh Father Frank Wale, why do you tolerate them? We have no right to stop anybody mm -hmm. to join the party. If they behave in the party, they are welcome. They misbehave in the party, the party will throw So them these out members that you say it's a matter of discipline, what in the party's rules did they violate? I started discussing every one of them here. That would be fair, Costa. Even in the letters we have seen where we have dismissed them, have you ever seen us start listing, you have done this, you have done that? Who does that in politics? I've never seen a political party do that. If it's done, it's very rare. Mm -hmm. When Mr. Sata, how many secretary generals did Mr. Sata remove? Did you see Mr. Sata listing the, the, the offenses? We had my brother Winter. When he was removed as secretary general, did you see any offenses that he committed? To this very day, do you, do, has anybody told you what mm. offense he committed? If, if you are true to your word, Dr. Member, that you, you are not ruling or running this party uh, with, with a heavy fist or you've, you've denied dictatorial tendencies, I'll take you back to one thing you told me when I interviewed you uh, during the 2021 mm. you know, election campaign. You, at some point, refused me to address you as sort of president of the Socialist Party because you said you were basically a candidate being put forward by the party. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you said. You were a member, but you were being put as a president, and you didn't want to be called really as president general of the party. So here's my question. Is the Socialist Party so democratic to the core that it can run with a leadership aside from yourself? Yes. Even biologically, biological factors come in. For how long am I going to lead the Socialist Party? For how long can one live? Our job is to create a new leadership for the party, to create a new leadership for the country. That's why when we started the party, the first thing we did was to set up a party school. We set up a party school before we even started operating the party to train leaders in all sorts of ways. We are spending more on training than any political party. So after losing the 2021 election, what does the constitution and the party statutes of the Socialist Party say in so far as the leadership and who goes for the election in 2026? Are we open for Dr. Member to be challenged or he remains the commander or the commandant of the Socialist Party? I'll tell you something. When we, after we lost the elections in 2021, I told them I'm, no, I'm not a presidential candidate for 2026 because my adoption at that time was for 2021. So was it for our parliamentary candidates for our councillors and mayors. The party's leadership sat down and said, no, we can't leave a vacuum like for MPs and councillors. It takes time to develop a presidential candidate. We are going to Congress on the 19th of September. This year? Yes. Are you we contesting? It's not for me. If I'm nominated, you have to be nominated to contest. Will you accept if you're nominated? It took one year, six months for me to accept initially. We formed the party, but we did not form the party to become its size. Today is the 18th, surely a month before September, the yes. next Congress. Are you thinking about it? We did not form the party to become a president, to become this and that. It took one year, six months to convince me to be the presidential candidate of the party and lead the Are party. Are you thinking about it? I belong to an apparatus. I belong to an apparatus. I'm ready to serve in any position that the party assigns me to, that the people I'm working with assign me to. If they find a better presidential mm -hmm. candidate tomorrow, they are free to do it. I didn't join the party to become a president. Does and my being a member of the party is not conditioned on me being the leader of it. Does the Socialist Party believe in democratic tenets and is this what we'll see you going towards next month? You can't have socialism without democracy. Mm. So you're a democrat? Yes. And we'll see that flourish at your congress? Yes. People are, ready, are free to participate. Those who want to stand as presidential candidates can stand. 
those who want to stand as general secretary, general treasurer, and so on, can stand. So the leaving of these senior members does not dictate a crisis. The party is solid. No, there's no crisis. These are discipline issues. There's no, yes, different discipline issues. There's no crisis. The Socialist Party will not crumble because it is left. The UPND and is when, mm. when did they join, mm. those who have left? When did they join? They joined the, part, the Socialist Party along the way. They have left along the way. It won't die, just like other parties did not die when some members left. Mm. The Socialist Party will not die. Allow me to move to the discussion for tonight. The UPND's major campaign promise, really, is very clear before coming to office, was we'll fix the economy. Their strategy so far has focused on restructuring the country's debt uh, through the IMF. That's one thing they, they believe uh, they have scored hugely. Uh, they point at issues of upping, you know, the CDF from 1.6, you know, million per, per, per year to about under 28 million per year now to every constituency as a decentralization equalizer. And they talk about issues of increasing the social welfare, you know, paycheck to now 700 kwacha uh, for the disabled and, and the elderly, uh, you know, per month. And huge investments in terms of the mining sector. I think the other day the president was talking about over 10, you know, billion US dollars in mining, you know, exploration and investment coming into Zambia, sorting out the issues around Mopani with Glencore and resolving the KCM impasse with Vedanta, you know, outside of court and that people are now are beginning to get paid. Surely for them, they think that they are on the right path to restructuring Zambia's economy and fixing it. What is your take? <laughs> Because there's nobody who goes into government and says, I've done nothing. I've done nothing, but I still want to continue in the government, still vote for me. No matter how poor the performance, they will still say they have done this and that and that and that. They will sing songs. Even on the things they did not do, they will sing songs. It's not for me really or for them what they say that really matters, what I say that really matters. As I've said before, what matters is how the living conditions of our people are. Are the Zambian people today better off economically, socially, and otherwise than they were three years ago? Are they eating better today than they were eating three years ago? Are their health services needs better taken care of today than they were three years ago? Are they less stressed in their day-to-day -day lives than they were three years ago? If they are, then glory to the UPND leadership. They will support them. They have a point in what they are saying. But if it's not, then I'm afraid the reality will show a different direction. These are things people can see for themselves. I don't need to tell people they are living better today than they were. The people will tell you they are living better. They are less stressed than they were. What are the people telling you? you? In fact, let me not say, what are the people telling you? You're equally a citizen and providing leadership through the checks and balances of the opposition. So let's hit the nail on the head. Are you, as citizens, do you feel you're living better? The middle class today is complaining. It's not only the lower people. You yourself today are, is complaining. You are complaining about your cost of living, your standard of living, your business, your business performance. You are complaining. You are not happy where you are there with your life. <laughs> I have spoken to you privately. <laughs> and uh, I'm not trying to embarrass you in public. But you are a citizen like me. 
unfortunately i'm not privileged today to sit and 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 divulge that yes so in that so so i would rather i, I play the neutral role of asking you no on, I, on, on I, behalf I, of the citizenry and you being a, a political party leader yes and i'm giving an example my opinions of, won't matter in yes, this interview just like mine won't matter in this interview sure it's they just matter. one voice your voice also matters mm -hmm. You are a leader of this country. They own, it's not only the politician with the leader. You are a leader of this country. Don't diminish your position. You are just equally as a, a, a leader as me. You are a leader. Your opinion matters. Your views matter, just as mine. Sometimes, in certain respects, you, your view may be even more, taken more seriously than mine. Because the politician is the most lowly graded person or rated person mm -hmm. your opinion probably carries more weight than mine as a journalist your credibility is higher than over a politician mm -hmm. so costa you are a leader your opinion matters if it doesn't matter to others it matters to me i've been in your shoes my opinion did matter when i was a journalist my opinion did influence things as a journalist, and yours does, probably more than mine. Well, thank what you. you told me about well, your, your living conditions well, matter. Thank you for that. And but, 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 sorry but, for divulging. But today's is not about me. It's about you as Socialist Party leader. Um, Wherever I go, people are crying. Mm -hmm. They are crying about food, the cost of foodstuffs the cost of everything that they need to run a dignified life. They are crying about medicines. They are crying about fuel. They are crying about electricity. Now electricity tariffs are going to be increased 156%. What will be the situation for that poor welder, for that poor poultry farmer? for that farmer who has to irrigate, and so on. What will be the cost of transportation, and so on. There are so many things people are crying about. Mm. Wouldn't we then be so harsh and unfair um, on a performance scale to say that the UPND have failed um, only in three years when they inherited a debt mountain externally of almost 14 billion dollars and a debt that was defaulted on um, obviously inheriting when you talk about the fuel costs fuel that through subsidies had hit over 800 million dollars you know worth of debt and in fact they also argue that there was no major investment or responses to what climate change and and increase in the hydro generation power so isn't three years too much of harshness to judge them when they're trying to correct the mess that they inherited firstly the upnd themselves were very harsh on their friends. They never accepted any mitigating factor. Only numbers mattered to them. Only facts mattered to them. Factors did not matter to them. The issue of COVID-19 didn't matter to them. The issue of not having enough water in the Kariba didn't matter to them. They despised it. They never looked at anything else in a positive way or in another way other than put the blame on their friends. They knew everything. They promised to fix everything. Everything was easy. That's easy. It's just brain matter. This and that. They demeaned everybody else. Every, everybody else knew nothing about economics knew nothing about finance, knew, knew nothing about administration, apart from themselves. Today they are facing the same factors. They want the factors to go their way, to be favorable to them, but not to their friends. How, how then would one have reacted? They got into government knowing all these things. They were very intelligent people. They knew everything. And they knew how to fix it. Mm. 
and they promise on day one this will happen, on day two this will happen. Because they knew everything. How then do we expect then as citizens one to react to things like an act of God, like a drought? It's, it's beyond intelligence. They told us how we should react. They said low water in the Kariba is not a factor. We have Saudi Arabia that doesn't have rain. They had an answer to everything. They had a justification for everything. It's not me to answer for them. I'm not here to crucify them. I'm simply stating what they stated themselves. Based on the status quo, we are hit with a drought that has triggered a food deficit. Over six million Zambians in need of food relief, which obviously we're told, you know, government through the DMMU is getting, uh, you know, maize from Tanzania and, and, and other places. Subsequently, apart from the food deficit, we're hit with an energy crisis. The energy minister last week announcing that effective September we will now experience 17 hours of load shedding because we're only remaining with 10% of water for hydropower within the Zambezi and the Kariba. How else would have one responded? How did they respond to some of these things themselves? Let's take the issue of food. People warned them about depleting reserves of maize. I did, at least on my part, and many others, including in Parliament. What were their answers? Their they, answers said, they said they had to pay the farmers. No, they said they will not stop exporting maize. They were being told, don't export maize. They said they will not stop exporting maize. They had enough maize. Intelligent are there. They did not understand what a reserve means. They were exporting maize, meal, meal, taking away all the stocks that were there. We wouldn't be in the crisis that we're in with maize now if they had listened. The same arrogance was exhibited on electricity, exporting. They had an explanation for everything. Now they have got contracts which they say they can't break easily, and so on. But back to the maze, the president, even as far back as yesterday when I watched him speak at some traditional ceremonies, is talking to people to say, Hagainde cannot be blamed for the lack of rain. It's an act of God. Had we had a successful rain season, the, 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 the yield would have been phenomenal because so many Zambians had responded to his call that everybody should participate in maize farming. So the, the input, according to them, in terms of what they projected in terms of yield was very good. There was very good planting. Sadly, uh, an issue beyond their control, beyond intelligence, yes. happened. What are reserves for? Why do we keep reserves? We keep reserves for the good times. We keep reserves for the good rain seasons, for the good harvests. We keep reserves for the rain day, or the day when there's no rain, when, when there are adverse factors that affect production. Those things happen. Even from biblical times, reserves were kept. Interestingly, also now quoting the Bible, the, 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 the president who says he's an elder in the SDA church says these are biblical times where people went through seven years of hunger. Seven years of building up reserves and seven years of using the reserves. Read the Bible. So who, who, who is interpreting the Bible wrongly or better between you no, and President Hitchin? No, no, it's not interpreting. I'm not even interpreting. I'm just reading what is there in the Bible. Mm -hmm. During the period of hunger or drought, there were reserves being built. During the period of dr drought, the reserves were used, even with surpluses. So in short, you're saying we, we messed up on the reserve issue despite the drought. We could have had more in stock. The noise was loud. Regardless of the fact that I spoke to the finance minister a few months ago, their reasoning is that they had to pay 
farmers being owned by FRA, so they had to sell the maize in stock. We have got... Uh, and nobody will go hungry, according to this government. They're saying everybody's been taken care of. If they're being taken care of, then no problem. They shouldn't complain. And nobody will complain. And we'll be very happy if everybody is taken care of. But I've been to places where there's hunger. If they are taking care of everybody, then we are safe. We should be happy and clap for them. But that's not the reality. Mm. Now let's talk a bit further about this maize situation. Coming from this deficit, um, there was concern raised that when we began looking at maize alternatives, um, I remember as far back as President Wanawasa, this government's or country's position was that we will not consume genetically modified maize for our people. And it was a concern with maize coming from South Africa, which we were told was headed into the Congo. Zambia was merely being used as a conduit. There's a new story that we are investigating of an aflatoxin uh, coming out of some maize products, whether it's into dog pellets and dog food, but a huge suspected concern that you know, this could be in our millimeter, which is our staple food and highly, you know, consumed. What is your take as a socialist party on issues surrounding maize, agriculture, and GMOs, and really how, you know, strong or porous our borders are, or just how we've handled this issue regards importation? Are we doing a good job in ensuring that what we're getting is safe for human consumption? With the food. <laughs> The first most important thing is the safety of that food. People should not just consume food, but the food should be safe for consumption. If the food is not fit for human consumption, it ceases to be food. You can have a cob of maize that is not fit for human consumption. It's no longer food. Food is something that you can safely eat and it's good for your body, it's good for your health. When meal meal is poisoned or maize is poisoned, it seems to be food. That's why it's thrown away. Even in our homes, food that is no longer safe to eat, we throw away. It's no longer food. We are throwing it away because it's no longer food. Our people deserve to be fed food that is safe. If there is anything that is suspicious, any suspicion that the food is poisoned, that food should be excluded from being food. A serious government will take away that food. And after investigations, if it's found really not to be safe, destroy it. Should we pay a blind eye because it's only affecting dogs or animals? No, but it's rora meal. The rora meal is eaten by both humans and dogs. Mm. The food we consume as human beings, sometimes it's the same food the, uh, the dogs consume. If, if the same food we consume that we give to our dogs kills the dog, it's also harmful to the human being. Probably we, we have not had vets, human vets detecting that human beings are dying. But the government needs to move in very quickly, establish the truth about it, find out the, 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 what is on the ground. Are human beings consuming this maize that is killing dogs? If indeed they are, there's need to urgently put a stop to it, immediately put a stop to it, until it's cleared to be safe. Food must be cleared to be, must be cleared to be safe for it to be distributed to human beings. And we have institutions in the country dealing with that. Where are those institutions that should check the things and ensure that the food that goes to the market is safe? We have health inspectors and so many others. If the food is not safe, it shouldn't. The GMO food, the Mwanawasa government stood up against the GMO. GMO is not good food. It's not good food. And actually, you know, besides just GMO not being good food, we are also benefiting from it right now, from having non-GMO uh, seeds. We are growing a lot of seed in this country that is not GMO. That is being exported. It's not talked about, but it's a huge part of our agriculture exports. We are exporting seed. In most of these countries where they are growing GMO foodstuffs, they are growing also GMO seed. 
So there are countries that need GMO seed. We have exports from this country of vegetables of this and that in Europe. We're exporting seed to Europe. Our farmers, our producers here, seed producers are doing that. If we go GMO, all these plants will close. And we will not have this business because they already have plants producing GMO elsewhere. It's not many local farmers, you see, international companies coming to produce here, coming to buy seed here. How, so, do, how do we regulate this? Or how do we control it moving forward? for our own security and safety. The same things we did under the Mwanawasa government and all these other governments. Stop getting GMO stuffs in here. Create a niche for ourselves, for our farmers and others. And but also, don't you think we play a double standard, Doctor Member? Because yes, maybe from the seed perspective, a bit on the millimill side, which of late I know we were also fortifying and so on. But we, we don't do so much manufacturing in this country. So you can have, in short, most of our, our our malls and our retail outlets are flooded with highly imported goods that, from start to finish, are produced in a GMO format. Uh, from different countries, we are importing a lot of GMO finished products. Give your people a choice. Give your people a choice as far as possible as you can. Give them a choice to know what they are eating and choose what to eat. Earlier on, you touched on the issue of an intent. I think we saw a headline just today that. Uh, government may be going into approval of an emergency request from Zesco on the tariffs to about 156 percent. This surely is really not even a slap, but it's like a noose on a consumer, it's a noose on the SME. 17 hours of no power, that's like almost 80 percent of productive hours. Then close to just under 200 percent of of electricity that you're not getting. We just came through at Mulungushi an energy in Davao, an energy forum for Africa. This government is telling us that the president and his ministers are spending sleepless nights to sort to avert this energy crisis. Do you, do you feel that their sleepless nights are yielding solutions? Are you confident as, as a citizen, are you confident as a political player that we are heading towards the right direction in averting this energy crisis? As a citizen, any solution that increases my burden is not a solution. A solution should reduce my stress, it should re reduce the burden being put on me. If I was having 12 hours load shedding and you are increasing it to 17, to me it's not a solution. A solution should reduce the 12 hours to something smaller. So we would say, they have no solution. Increasing the hours to 17 is not a solution. From 12 to 17, it's not a solution. What, what solution is the Socialist Party offering? What would you have done? if you were in government, or really, your job is to also provide checks and balances as a government in waiting. How should we approach this energy crisis? Firstly, let's look at it. The, the Kariba Dam, you know, it's not totally dry. It's not totally dry. You share the Kariba Dam water with Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe's water uptake is still higher than yours now. They still have more water to take. You have exhausted more of your water than them. They are not having the same hours of load shedding that you are having. Because the situation is different. No, they use they, they, the they, ration. They, inv they invested into more coal plants. N no, not necessarily that. They used their, they rationed their water. We have one of these and this water. Yes, it. are you saying we were careless? We were. We were. If we rationed our water well, we couldn't be at this level would be in the same situation with Zimbabwe. But Dr. Member, one would argue because I think Zimbabwe is just coming out of this. They were more worse. I think in the previous years they consumed their, their portion of water faster. Mm -hmm. I think the argument is that they recently 
you know, just commissioned a 600 megawatt coal power plant, uh, unlike us who are largely dependent solely on hydro. It was only last week when we were doing Unfortunately, not even commissioning, but, but groundbreaking Z of the three hundred. Zimbabwe is not exporting electricity the way you're exporting. Check the facts. Zimbabwe is not exporting. You were exporting. You were using more of your water to export electricity. You were exporting. The water levels you, you consume them like any other some uh, anything else that is depletable. So you were producing more electricity to export and make some money. They were not. The coal, this is not the first time we're having a coal plant. There's a coal plant there that is expanding. They are not the first one to, to get into the coal plant. It's expanding. It was started by the previous regime. In fact, the previous regime moved the megawatts we have much, much bigger. Mm -hmm. But, but surely the government has said they've reduced now on the exports and are trying to bring up other, you know, I innovations or incentives into the energy mix. And Dollar Energy has come up with 105, you know, megawatts. They are saying all government departments need to go solar and so on. They've removed, you know, duty and tax waivers on solar products. That's their solution. Isn't that a step in the right direction? Is that reducing the hours? It's a solution. Is it reducing the hours of load shedding? If it's a solution, why increase the, the hours of load shedding? And why also increase the tariffs by 156%? So for you as a socialist, the best thing would be to, if, if you cut out all the exports, would the hours decrease? No, I'm saying they say they have got a solution. You are saying that's their solution. But is it a solution that is solving the problem? In short, you're not happy with your solution. What would you be suggesting or proposing, Dr. Nand? For me, a solution is something that reduces my burden. And the burden is the hours of load shedding. People's businesses are being killed. Does the Socialist Party have any blueprint or expertise? You used to give some of these. Has, has there been a thought process in terms of how we can address this as a country? Yeah, we have, people, we have people working on these issues. We have people. Is there a solution already crafted? Yes, we do have, but it's a continuous process. Are you willing to share? Not here for now. It's still work in progress. So you're also not in a position to, to no, say these guys no. have failed because equally maybe are no. stuck like them. No, no, we're not stuck. We're mm. not in the government. Mm. We are not in the government. If we were in the government, we would do things very So different. it's the usual political clash or, or, or lashing to say they have failed, we can do better, mm. yet there's no solution in the offing? They said they had a solution. Do you have a solution? We, we have, it's a challenge that we have to face. And we have to, de to deal with it differently. And we'll deal with it differently. Those are semantics, Dr. Member. Differently in the offing. Uh, do we have a solution as a socialist um, party? Are we in government? That, that, that if we came into 2026, we'd be saying the socialist party will get us out of 17 hours of load shedding. We will definitely get you out of 17 hours of load shedding. But with a plan you're not willing to share for now? Yes. Why? We are working on those things. I've told you part of it is work in progress. But these are things that are going to work. Mm. For the sake of time, uh, I, I'm sorry I, I, I had to rush you into so many things, but this is very critical. Um, apart from the economy, the governance aspects, the rule of law and, and, and order is one huge issue. This administration promised issues around, you know, legal reforms and, and, and so on. And this question can be loaded. It's have, have, have we seen any form of legal reforms apart from the fact that they are saying they've restored the rule of law and order because there's, there's safety in public spaces, markets and so on. But I think the biggest elephant in the room is issues surrounding their corruption record and graft fight. Um, on one hand, they'll say, uh, some research is saying they've done better in terms of the CPI, you know, index, uh, while others will argue that there's no major conviction in terms of what they're doing. But to just put the icing on the cake, it's what recently happened 
at the ACC following Brian Carver's revelations and what is happening with the Solicitor General and, you know, the, the Director General at the ACC, the board being dissolved. How does this all sit with you? I've said before that Mr. Hakainde Ichilema is not capable of lead, leading a just and effective and efficient fight against corruption because he's highly, highly conflicted. He's in the midst of this corruption himself. He's in the midst in of In short, this you're accusing the president of being corrupt? Yes, I'm accusing him. Again, I've challenged you this. When you came here last time, you said he's giving contracts to his friends in fertilizer. Why haven't you reported him? Where are the facts? We did that. It was publicized. We have never held our views. Did you take these facts to the anti-corruption commission? How many people have taken things to the anti-corruption? Kamba, you, you are telling me a story of a director of the anti-corruption commission is saying this attorney general is corrupt. Has he been prosecuted? What happened in, it, in return? Kamba himself is dissolved. He is no longer a director. The attorney general he was accusing is still a director. And they arrange for some meeting somewhere and reconcile that to their relatives. Without telling you that I lied or I was wrong, he has not repudiated anything, anything that he said. Again, I'm putting it here. Mr. Hichilema is leading or is at the helm of the most corrupt regime in the history of our country. The question is, should, and it, should, 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 should it be about the president in power or the system and no, the laws? the corruption centers around him. As an individual? Yes. Isn't it systems that guide? No, he, this corruption centers around him. He's highly, highly conflicted. That's why he can't even declare his assets. The day Mr. Hichilema will declare his assets, see, that will be the beginning of his walk to prison. He can't. He's, catch, he's caught in a catch-22. If he declares, it's a problem. He doesn't declare, you have these arguments we are making against him. But he's declared his assets based on the electoral rules. Wait. And that again, I had John Sangwa here last week. The law does not mandate a sitting president to declare their assets except at the time when they are filing those nominations. Whether the, the law requires him to declare or not to declare, if it's not, he has not declared, it shows you where the problems are. There's so much inside dealing by himself. There's so much inside dealing. Those are allegations, those are speculations. You as a lawyer know better that there's yes, no, prima, speaking, there's no prima facie yes, evidence I'm, laid on I'm the table, Dr. Member. I'm speaking to you as a lawyer, yes. I can't make these but allegations. But where's the prima facie evidence that this, what you're saying is true? So this table is a court. <laughs> but, but when this table is a court. <laughs> well, well, no, we, we, I'm, we, I'm we, telling you, it, 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 it is not a court if doctor. Mr. It is not a court doctor. If Mr. Ichile Mafuse, I'm defaming him. But, but I have to, uh, I'm asking again in public interest that if you come here and say he's leading the most corrupt regime in Zambia's history, that he himself is conflicted and at the center of corruption. Surely yes, but nine ministers being investigated. You, you where must, have, you ever, you where have, have you ever, where have you ever heard nine ministers being investigated? And they can't even tell you who those nine ministers are. And none of them has been f suspended or fired. How? Huh? Where? Where? The presumption of innocence. They're being investigated. They have not been... When you're um, investigated, mm. you have this... So is it how much millions for, for the Kenyan deal with the army? With the army? Have you had anybody being suspended from the army? The fact that they're being investigated shows that there's commitment to doing the right thing, isn't it? How many investigations against his own people have come up with the corruption charges. Even the fertilizer deal you are talking about, who has been arrested? 
He can't arrest anybody on that fertilizer deal because he was part of it. But again, I'm asking, why, if these things are not reported, how then will we see a conclusion? We have been saying these things for the last three years, almost three years. What has he done about it? I've been saying this, I've written about it, I've said it here. Has he come to arrest me? As he does. Let him come and arrest me for accusing him of corruption. So, when the president says we will see corruption, I mean, one of the things is he stood for is that do not arrest anybody until you thoroughly investigate and believe that there's credible evidence against these individuals, number one. Number two, the formulation of what are being called, you know, um, were the fast track courts, for lack of a better term, the, the, the financial crimes court. He's saying we now need to speed up these matters to five months. And the Chief Justice has agreed that they're prosecuting these corruption matters. So again, for you, there's nothing much being done in terms of the graph file? Who is being in, tried in those uh, fast track courts? Who? It's all his political opponents from the, from the PF. There is no UPND member or official, government official of this government who has gone there, or any other person. Those were kangaroo, uh, kangaroo courts created to just prosecute a certain group of people. You don't do that. And you believe that our judiciary is not autonomous enough to yes, hold it's, into it's that not. for you to accuse them of holding kangaroo It's court? not, yes. How were those courts set up? Where did the pronouncement come from? Didn't it come from Akainde himself first? Those courts were created by Akainde, but not by the Chief Justice, strictly speaking. They simply implemented this decision. And they were created to prosecute or persecute PF people. Nobody else, show me anybody and else other alleging, than... And you're alleging that the learned and competent members of our judiciary could allow to be used to operate kangaroo courts? Yes, they're operating a kangaroo court. Who else are they trying in that court, other than one group of politicians from PF? Who else outside the PF leadership is in, that, in those courts? So, Tell me any so, other so, so, person so, you know other than from the PF leadership who is in those courts. Whether PF or UNIP, if people did wrong things, the law must take its course. Yeah. Are you telling me over the last three years there is no corruption from UPND? Are you telling me this government is corrupt, corruption free? Nobody should be taken to those courts. We are living in the, in the most decent, under the most decent regime. These are angels. None of them is corrupt. They've admitted. They will only become corrupt They've admitted after they leave office. Speak. But finally. These are angels. None, there's no corruption in this country anymore. Well, the corruption ended with the PF. Over the last three years, can you tell a Zambian that there's no corruption in this country? Definitely we've seen matters be, uh, coming up. Where, show me one case that has gone to those courts, that I'm calling kangaroo courts. Mm. Finally, Dr. Membe, how then would you describe whether it's through a matrix analysis of giving them an out of 10 or basically a sentimental you know, reaction? How would you describe the last three years of the UPND? This is the greatest deception I've ever seen in this country. People who deceived the Zambian people that they were going to give them a government that is decent, that is efficient, that is effective, that is orderly. And it has turned out to be the opposite. They are corrupt. They are inept, they are ineffective, they are disorderly. They came pretending they were these angels when they are nothing but to borrow from Mr. Kainde, hyenas. This is a government of hyenas on the bones. When you try to get nearer, they bite, they kill. At the rate they are going, they will kill. 
the level of greed is too high. It's too high. I've never seen this greedy. Everything they wanted to take, everything they want to have a cut in for themselves. Zambians are not fools. They are seeing all this. You can ask me to put evidence here. We have heard that story before. That story has been running for years, bring the evidence, bring the evidence. Every regime did that. Those who are saying bring the evidence, they are in, in jail today. Some of them, they were saying bring the evidence of corruption, they are in jail today. These can also say bring the evidence, they will be in jail also next time by others. The sad part of not having independent institutions is you wait until those who are running government to get out is when one group comes to sort out these others. If we had independent investigative institutions, this wouldn't be there. For the socialists, we have stated it clearly, the fight against corruption will start with ourselves. And we have told our members, we win elections in August, some of them by December they will be in prison. Why should you wait to be in government? Why don't you take them to law we have, attempt, we have attempted to even prosecute things privately. We have been rejected. You can't prosecute a criminal matter in this country without the authority of the DPP. You can't. It's a waste of time, even attempting. And we are not a law enforcement agency. We are a political party. We are not a law enforcement agency. Even yourselves, you cover corruption, you expose corruption as a media, or you should be able to. And the media is not doing very well right now, the Zambian media. It's not doing very well in terms of exposure. It's just carrying statements. There's no investigative journalism that is going on in the country today. The dependence on the journalists now is very low now in terms of exposing crimes and corruption in society. So the journalists fed the political elites in terms of the discourse on corruption. We are not being fed by you today. You are the people supposed to be digging out this corruption. But today you want us to dig this corruption for you. As a fellow journalist, I can say, Comrade Costa, we are not doing well in the media. There are reasons for that anyway. We can go into the reasons, and the reasons are justifiable. But the fact is, we are not doing well. Mm. There are factors behind that. On that high note of uh, self-media introspection, I'd like to say thank you for talking to me tonight. Unfortunately, we end there. Thank you very much. My guest this evening has been the Socialist Party leader, Dr. Fred Member. We've been discussing, among other issues, the three years of the UPND in office. Remember that you can catch this interview on our YouTube page. It's Diamond TV Zambia. Remember to subscribe if you've not subscribed. You might just stand a chance of being entered into our weekly draw for you to get that power bank and some Zamtel internet data uh, that goes with a Zamtel SIM card. But also remember to click that bell icon for notifications for you not to miss out on any of our programming online on our YouTube page. It's Diamond TV Zambia. Thank you so much for watching. Good night. to you by FQM Trident Limited, a subsidiary of First Quantum Minerals Limited.